everyone and welcome back to personality theory. In this section we'll be talking about chapter 10 which will be covering the person situation or interactionist aspects of personality. So in this one we're finally going to bring together all of the theories that account for how our internal factors are influenced by the external factors that surround us. All right so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so first I'm going to introduce you to a new theorist that we haven't met before, Harry Stack Sullivan. Um, again, you can probably tell from the picture that he was working probably in the middle of the last century is a pretty good characterization of when he was doing his theoretical work. Um, he defined personality as relatively enduring patterns of recurrent interpersonal situations. Um, so he was taking this interpersonal theory of psychiatry. He was actually the founder of a school of thought called the interpersonal theory of psychiatry. This is a good time to mention that psychiatrists are different from psychologists in that psychiatrists are medical doctors. So he had, um, you know, a slightly different training than a lot of the theorists that we've been talking about. He would be more analogous to Freud being a doctor, a, a medical doctor. The remainder of the theories, theorists that we've talked about have been more likely to be PhDs in psychology. All right. So he's also got a slightly different definition of personality than what has been, you know, sort of ruling us throughout the quarter, right? Throughout the quarter, we've been talking about, you know, those behaviors that are consistent across time and contexts, right? So it's kind of an external assessment of, you know, consistency. So we would be able to see that you behaved in a similar fashion, you know, when you were 15, as you do now, um, when you're in class versus when you're at work, or, you know, we would be able to see, you know, consistency across contexts and across time. He's arguing that it's much more of an interpersonal issue, right? And a relatively enduring pattern of recurrent interpersonal situations. So he's talking about how relatively enduring means that it's something that happens consistently over time, right? That you would expect to see this pattern across time and repeatedly, that's what recurrent means, but he's focusing on interpersonal situations that he's kind of arguing that you put yourself into similar situations. Um, you choose situations that have similar interpersonal dynamics, basically. So a slightly different definition than what we've been working with so far in this class. He talks about personality being malleable, right? He says we have this illusion of individuality. Um, he says in reality, we become different people in different social situations. And I put different in quotation marks because, I mean, he doesn't think that you have multiple personality disorder and lose all consciousness for yourself in, you know, different times. That's not what he means. Um, but what he was referring to is that if an outside observer who didn't know you and only watched you behave in different ways in different situations, they would come to a conclusion that you actually show more variation in your personality, um, then you probably think you're displaying. We, he, he thinks that we carry with us this illusion that we're consistent, this illusion that we have like this core sense of self that governs us and is consistent and things like that. Um, he says that in reality, in each situation, we imagine how other people are thinking of us and we, we respond accordingly. We alter our behaviors to either fulfill like positive imp impressions that they might be having about us or to um, not fulfill what we might be perceiving to be negative assessments of us. And so our behavior changes in response to what other people are putting out and their behavior is being altered by us. So he says this whole sense of um, continuity, consistency, um, you know, individuality, all of this is really just an illusion that we carry with us as we, in our minds, as we think about our own behavior, um, we focus in on the times that we're, we're consistent, we ignore the times that we are inconsistent and it just fosters this incorrect belief about ourselves. Um, now, being a psychiatrist, it's not surprising to think that he might have um, a theory that includes these, you know, threats to our sense of self, like Freud and Jung and the other um, neo-Freudians did. 
he said that you can tell he's English because he calls our peers chums. Um, we might call them friends or something, but he calls them chums. Um, he says the source of threats comes from um, basically our peers and how we're fitting in with our peers. So he really emphasizes how important it is to have chums, you know, friends, people who we feel like know us and accept us. He says um, when we see people developing in a healthy way or we see people developing in an unhealthy way, it, it probably could be distilled down to ways that peers have reacted to us over our you know, developmental years. When we were little, our peers gave us feedback about whether our behaviors or our, our natural tendencies were right or wrong, um, made us valuable or, or less valuable to them, um, caused us to fit in or caused us to be um, you know, more of an outcast. So um, he thought that peers were probably the most important factor in help, helping to determine how our personality ultimately develops. That we have a lot of biological component to our personality and then it's the reactions of others that shape our expression of those biological predispositions. Um, overall, he blames society for most of our psychological problems. He would probably be having a heyday with uh, society right now in you know 2022, having spent two years relatively isolated from each other, um, being told stuff about um, each other to polarize us so that we think of, you know, some members of society as our in-group and other members as a, a not just an out-group, but like a despised out-group. Um, he would probably just be having a heyday with, with what's going on right now. Not that the middle of the tw 20th century wasn't full of those kinds of things, too. I mean, we had just finished a world war and, um, you know, there were similar kinds of divisions going on politically as far as um, attitudes and stuff. So, you know, I don't think the political parts of it are that different, but I think he'd be um, wringing his hands over this two years of isolation that we all just survived. And, um, and then at the same time, having very um, controlled media, even when you thought you were just talking to other people who you knew on social media, the truth is some things that your friends said were allowed or not allowed to be posted and things like that. Um, this kind of manipulation, I think he'd be having a heyday with the issues um, because I think he would be talking about how this is not really a healthy way for us to be growing and developing and becoming our full selves. Um, I think a lot of us would agree with that. Now, he had stages of development much like Erickson did. I'm showing the whole life, the whole um, span of his stages just so you could kind of get a picture of it. So you'll notice he has, um, you know, the infancy period. Um, he called childhood two to six years of age. And then he had a, ju a juvenile area that's six to eight and a half, which is a, a kind of an unusual age bracket. Um, then he has the pre-adolescent period from about eight and a half to 13. And then early adolescence he thought was separate from late adolescence. And so that makes him different from other um, theorists who have stages of development also. Um, and then he thought instead of having, like Erickson thought that there were um, conflicts that occurred at each age and you had to solve it on the right side or the wrong side, if you remember that. Um, he thought, uh, Sullivan thought that at different stages you had different significant others different people who played the main role in your um, development at that point. So infancy is governed by the mother. Um, by childhood, it's the mo mother and the father. By the juvenile era, the playmates start to become really important. And then by pre-adolescence, finding a single chum, as he indicated, having like one person who is really like your best friend is really important. Um, early adolescence, now you have several chums trying to fit in and have um, you know a wider range of possible targets for late adolescence, you know, developing romantic attraction. He called it the lover phase. Um, and so you can kind of see the interpersonal processes that we learn from the significant other at these different stages. So our mother teaches us tenderness. Um, our parents teach us about having, you know, um, sociodramatic play is what we call it in developmental psychology, the idea to be able to um, come up with little plots to play and have, you might, maybe you have imaginary playmates who will be serve as your best friend. Um, in the juvenile era, your playmates teach you how to get along with your peers, how to fit in and, you know, not get um, shunted aside. Um, the single chum teaches us about intimacy, how to be, you know, um, attached to somebody, share information about ourselves, listen to information about them and not reject them, that kind of thing. Uh, by early adolescence, we're having several chums in part because um, we're further developing intimacy and then also starting to explore the um, 
interpersonal process of lust. And then um, in late adolescence is when we learn to fuse intimacy with lust in what he called the lover phase. So um, the things that we learn during these different stages, you know, we learn from our mothers what's good and what's bad. Um, we learn from our parents together, you know, syntactic language. So like how to actually convey our ideas, how to understand other people's ideas. From our playmates, we learn about competition, about compromising, how to cooperate. We learn from our single close chum, affection, respect. When we have a group of several chums, he says we learn about balance and security operations. You know, how to, the security operations is referring to how we can um, manage to feel secure, even though there's multiple people here. And, you know, I'm thinking of like an episode of Survivor where, you know, there's always somebody in the tribe who realizes that they're, they're at the bottom of the ladder. And if there was a tribal council tonight, they'd be the one voted out. Um, even when you recognize that, how do I maintain a sense of security within this group? And then during the lover phase, we discover more about ourselves and more about the world as we have this intimacy component with this person who we can then safely explore the world. Um, so there are things that we learn at every stage, but he's, you'll notice, has like a, a significant other that he thought was really important for helping to guide us in our development, which is very different from any of the other theories that we've really ever talked about. Um, really important is overarching all of this importance of the significant other is this innate component, this part where you have your predisposed tendencies to act in certain ways or to think in certain ways. And what our significant other is doing for us is helping us to channel our predispositions into sort of desirable, you know, peer desirable or socially desirable ways of expressing those things. So that ultimately by the time we reach full maturity, we have um, you know, styles of living that will be appropriate to other people, that other people will um, value and stuff like that. So um, Sullivan had a very different way of looking at personality, I think, than other people that we've talked about so far. But also it sounds kind of familiar. You can tell he was influenced by the psychoanalytic theorists and clearly um, Erickson had a big impact on him, but he was like, okay, I agree with you, Erickson, but I think you're a little bit off. I think you're taking out that interpersonal component. Um, so he, he inserted this significant other component. And then he also, um, the learnings are a little bit different than what the solutions to the conflicts in Erickson's theory were. Um, and then finally, the big difference between Erickson and Sullivan is that Erickson thought we continue to develop and that, you know, these conflicts would be present throughout our adult lives. Whereas Sullivan said, well, once you reach full physical development, hopefully you've had the correct significant others present for you to develop these interpersonal processes and have these learnings with you. Um, and then we'll have stability throughout adulthood. And so he has a very different perspective than, than Erickson with regard to that. Almost as if he was influenced really heavily by, for one thing, his medical training that led him to the conclusion that, you know, once you go through puberty, you've reached full development. And then I think also he was really strongly influenced by Freud, this idea that, you know, development will end once you've gotten through puberty. So I think he's influenced by a lot of different people to come to slightly different conclusions. So anyway, I thought you'd find his theory kind of interesting. I just, this chart doesn't really emphasize that much about the biological component. I think the thing that'll remind you about the biological component is that he really thought there were firm ages tied to these learnings and these interpersonal processes. So the only way that you can really have strong ages tied to something is if you think that there's sort of this biological impetus. There's something in our physical development that's going to trigger these interpersonal um, strivings that um, you're seeing in this model. So as long as you remember there are ages attached, that means therefore it must be biological. I think you're going to be pretty safe. All right. Well, our next person is Henry Murray. So let's go ahead and take a break here and we'll talk about Murray in the next segment.